Wow. Everybody made it out here nice and early, 8.30 on a sunny Cleveland day. I don't know if you heard the news on the way in, but John McCain said he may not make it to the debate tonight because there's a really, really important uh, event in uh, Cleveland, Ohio <laughs> about the crime of aggression that he thought he better go to. Uh, I don't know if he'll be showing up. David Letterman's still looking for him. But we are really, really glad that you're all here today. Um, I want to begin by um, thanking some people that have made all of this possible. Um, foremost of among those is the Wolf Family Foundation. Are any of the Wolf Family Foundation members here this morning? Um, okay, well, I'll just let you know about them in their absence and they can watch it on the video. Um, for the last four major conferences, they've been helping us out with funding on conferences on rebuilding nation building and torture and the war on terror, and on um, the 60th anniversary of the Genocide Convention, and then now on this conference today. And the Wolves are a family foundation, and it's a family that I've known for years. I was the best man at their daughter's wedding, and it's just really great when Cleveland area foundations help us out. Um, this conference was also made possible by the Planethood Foundation, and its representatives are Don Ferenz and Ben Ferenz, Ben, who's here, um, and the two of them actually were the ones that came up with the idea of this conference. We try to have conferences every year that are on the cutting edge that will change the world in some way and make an impact and allow academics and practitioners to come together. And this topic could not be more timely. With a month ago, Russia invading Georgia and the crime of aggression being on the front pages once again of newspapers everywhere. This conference is going to be dealing with some weighty issues and hopefully making a difference so that when the International Criminal Court Assembly of State Parties meets at their conference to decide whether to include the crime of aggression and how to do so, they will have the wisdom and the help of the folks at the conference. Um, I want to say a couple of other things about this, uh, I probably was remiss in not introducing myself. I know most of you know me, but I'm Professor Michael Scharf, the director of the Frederick K. Cox International Law Center at the law school. And on behalf of the law school, its faculty, its administration, we're really happy to host this event and have such famous and distinguished experts from all over the world coming here. Um, also, the Cox Center, which is running this, has had a really wonderful year. I just want to mention a couple of things. Um, this year, our Jessup International Law Moot Court team won the World Championships. It's just the second time in 17 years that an American team has done that. And it's the, a first for this school. Um, also, last year we had a number of major conferences and experts meetings, um, starting with one that the ICRC hosted here on detention, and there will be a special issue of our Journal of International Law, which is celebrating its 40th anniversary, about that coming out. Um, we also had a major conference on the Genocide Convention and a series of lectures on genocide. We had the Iraqi judges from the Iraqi High Tribunal, who are in the news again this week, um, here making their first appearance outside of Iraq. And they visited a couple of law schools, and we were lucky to be one of them. Um, we had a major conference hosted by our Institute for Global Security Law and Policy. And if Bob Strassfeld's here, uh, he's probably not. Um, he's the director of that. But it was on the um, dealing with counterterrorism financing. And uh, finally, we had a, a Canada-US Law Institute conference on secure, border security. So it was a very full year for us. And the, our colleagues from other schools have recognized what we're doing here and, and the unique program we have um, by ranking us in last year's US News poll as one of the top international law programs in the country tied with Cornell and Stanford. So we'll keep doing what we're doing. And we're glad that you're all a part of it. Um, let me say about the topic of this Bill Shabus, who's right here, has written a book called Genocide, the Crime of All Crimes. But Robert Jackson, who um, is named after the Jackson, or the Jackson Center uh, is named after him that Greg Peterson will be telling you a little bit about, he said at Nuremberg that the real crime of all crimes was the crime of aggression, because all other crimes flow from that. 
and yet, in 1992, when I was at the State Department as Attorney Advisor for UN Affairs, working with my colleagues, and some of them are here today, um, Sean Murphy there, um, on creating the Yugoslavia Tribunal, the one thing the U.S. government made absolutely clear of was that aggression would not be part of its statute. And when the Rwanda Tribunal statute was created, no aggression. Sierra Leone Tribunal, no aggression. Cambodia Tribunal, which is starting its trials in the fall, and I'm actually going to be leaving as part of my sabbatical to go out and help with the prosecution of those trials, no aggression. In fact, Richard Goldstone said in 1999 that he would have indicted Slobodan Milosevic five years earlier if he had had the crime of aggression, because that was the crime that Milosevic was so clearly guilty of, and yet he wasn't able to do that. <laughs> and so it was quite a surprise when the International Criminal Court statute was being negotiated in Rome and a couple of wise and gentlemen who had been through the ranks of Nuremberg showed up and said, you must, as a moral commitment, include the crime of aggression. And I'm talking, of course, about Henry and Ben and some of their colleagues. Um, and I think shamed by this, and there was a lot of immediate attention to this, there was a compromise reached where the ICC statute decided to say, yes, we will include the crime of aggression, we'll mention it now, and in 10 years, in 2010, when we have our review conference, if we can come up with a definition and a trigger mechanism, then it'll be there. And for the last 10 years, there have been negotiations trying to inch forward toward that. And we are now on the threshold of that. And yet there are big hurdles and obstacles. And so this conference is intended to bring the academic community, the practitioner community, some academics that used to be practitioners, <coughs> together to try to work through those final hurdles. And after this conference tomorrow, there's an experts meeting in which we will actually be doing some drafting. And then at the end of this conference, uh, Sharif Bassioni and, and Don Ferenc have come up with a declaration that we're going to ask people to sign um, once we get that typed up, called the Cleveland Declaration, which essentially says that we are committed to finding a way forward to have aggression included in the statute of the ICC. Now, before I turn my remarks over to the introduction by uh, Henry and Ben. Um, I do have one other last uh, function, and that is that we have several co-sponsoring organizations and also several people who helped me put this together. Um, one of the co-sponsoring organizations is the International Association of Penal Law. And every year at our conference, we begin by presenting our Book of the Year Award to the person who has written the best book in the field of international criminal law. Um, there were four finalists, and last year's Book of the Year Award winner, Mark Drumble, chaired a committee that read through these and decided which would win. And, and Mark's going to present the award and, and tell you a little bit about that very briefly, and then we'll start the next <coughs> session. Mark. Thank you, Michael. I will only take a minute of time uh, to talk about the process and the book that was selected, and only taking a minute really doesn't do justice the to the process. overall um, situation. The yeah, there we go. Can you display them one after the other? One on your head, maybe. Um, a lot of thought went into this, and uh, the books that were submitted, all of them were of incredible quality. And I think it's absolutely wonderful to see how our field is becoming so richly specialized and uh, how the quality of the scholarship continues to improve year by year. After our deliberative process, we opted that one of these four volumes uh, was just a touch better than the others. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the volume and let me tell you a little bit about the author. The uh, volume that was selected for the Book of the Year Award is Larry May's Aggression and Crimes Against Peace. Um, this is a book that was just published by Cambridge University Press in 2008. It is a spirited, interdisciplinary, and philosophical analysis. Um, Larry develops an argument according to which aggression ought to be defined as a first wrong that violates human rights, and that aggression is prosecutable when one state undermines the ability of another state to protect human rights by shifting the paradigm, by pushing us to think outside of traditional boundaries. We felt that Professor May's contribution was not only of wonderful practical application, but also a very, very um, creative 
theoretical insight. Uh, this is actually the third book that Larry has published on international criminal law. He also has a volume on crimes against humanity, um, excellent book on war crimes, this one. And true to form, he's going to cover all the terrain. He is currently working on a fourth book, um, a philosophical analysis of the law of genocide. So please uh, let us congratulate Professor May on this true tour de force. Larry, would you come down here? And you've got a little bit of hardware now that you can, that you can bring home. Congratulations. Thank you, Mark. OK. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce the next panel, the, the kickoff introduction to this conference. And to do that, we have the, direct, the chairman and former director and founder of the Robert Jackson Center, um, which is a partner in many things that we do here. And, and we're happy to work with them because they do such outstanding things. And that's Greg Peterson. Greg? Thank you, Michael. Um, I believe me, this is going to be really brief because we want to get to these guys immediately. I am the chairman of the board of the Robert H. Jackson Center. We're located in Jamestown, New York, and for you folks in Cleveland, we're just a shout away, as they would say. Uh, and we were created only seven years ago to advance the legacy of Justice Robert H. Jackson, and for our purposes, who he was the chief American prosecutor at the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg. And as the symposium today is designed the International Criminal Court and the Crime of Aggression. We know that 60 years ago, uh, the Nuremberg Tribunal convicted the Nazi leaders of waging a war of aggression, prompting Nuremberg prosecutor Robert Jackson to declare this was the most important contribution of the Nuremberg Tribunal. Um, more than 60 years later, it's just uh, clearly a topic which continues to evolve and a topic which is what we're going to learn about today. Uh, we're just thrilled to be a participant here with uh, the Frederick Cox International Law Center. And of course, Michael Scharf does such, such tremendous, tremendous work here. Uh, and, and for that, we uh, commend everybody who's part going to be participating in this event. Let me introduce the two superstars to my right and my left. Their biographies are in the book. Suffice it to say, that these are two of the individuals who were part of that Nuremberg process in 1945 and 1946 and thereafter. They were both at the IMT pro there when Justice Jackson was there. They both continued on to do extraordinary services at the subsequent Nuremberg trials. They both have continued on to do remarkable things in the world of international law and making sure the drum continues to be beat on things which are extremely important to all those in this room. To my right, Henry King was a uh, at the Nuremberg trial, as I mentioned, with uh, Justice Jackson. He continued on and was one of the lead prosecutors at the Erhard Milch trial. Milch was the number two man behind Hermann Goering. And Henry King, uh, at, during that time period, had a chance to interview, as part of the case preparation, Albert Speer. Thereafter, Speer became another uh, focus of Henry's life when he wrote a book entitled The Two Worlds of Albert Speer, interviewing him after he got out of Spandau prison. He continues to be an impact person in the world of international law, and I'm just thrilled that Henry's part of this panel. To my left, Ben Ferenc. Ben Ferenc, uh, another extraordinary individual, an author, and who is you're trying to author something called the Cleveland Declaration, which we look forward to Coming. seeing yeah, <laughs> with <laughs> Professor Bassione and uh, working on it last night, in fact, uh, over the thing there. I watched that. I observed that as it was being played out. It was terrific. Uh, ben Ferenc was also there during the IMT. He also stayed on and was the chief prosecutor on the Eitzengruppen case, and uh, which turned out to be the most significant and largest criminal case. Uh, ever. So uh, I won't go into any further details of their extensive biographies. Just suffice it to say, I want to sit back, relax, and enjoy the words of two of the foremost people in this field. And we'll Great. kick it off. I mentioned before you turn it over to them that the picture on the left has Henry King as second to the right. 
at the Nuremberg trial. The picture on the right is a young Ben Ferenz, and of course the picture at the bottom is Robert Jackson and all the defendants at Nuremberg. <laughs> I was just going to say that. That's terrific. <laughs> 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 I can't even see that. <laughs> I looked like that once. Yeah. <laughs> well, terrific. So note that they were all part of a world of which we at the Robert H. Jackson Center are part. And I just want to also briefly introduce, he came down this morning, leaving at 4 o'clock this morning, our executive director, Adam Bratton. So Adam, thanks for coming down and joining us. So without any further ado, Professor Henry King. Right. Uh, the problem of defining aggression as a crime that has wide support and as an effective tool for sustaining peace is not new. I think that as background for this conference, I could serve you best by reviewing the origin of the Nuremberg aggressive war charges, uh, <laughs> crimes against peace, as defined by the victorious four powers in the London Charter of August 8, 1945, and tracing their involvement through the 12 subsequent proceedings at Nuremberg. By looking at the checkered success of the aggressive charge, aggression charge, I hope to provide a context for the current effort to define effort, ag aggression in such a way as to make it acceptable to 7 eighths of the 106 or so nations of the governing assembly of states that have ratified the Rome Statute of July 1998, establishing the permanent international criminal court. One of the revolutionary aspects of Nuremberg was that it held individuals responsible for criminal acts they committed in the name of their country. Aggressive war was up until then an active state that did not lead to individual liability. The new approach was based largely on the work of William C. Chandler, a law partner of the Secretary of War, Henry L. Simpson, who, <laughs> who succeeded in getting it adopted as U.S. policy. It was Chandler who was among the first to argue that there should be individual liability for engaging in crimes against peace. The basis of Chandler's argument that aggression should be an international crime was the Kellogg-Brien Peace Pact of 1928, which outlawed war as an instrument of national policy. The pact was ratified by over 60 nations, including Germany. Chandler's contribution was to criminalize aggression and to punish individuals for starting aggressive war. His approach would correct the situation where individuals such as Kaiser Wilhelm II, who start, had much to do with the start of World War I, would go <coughs> scot-free after the war. He lived about 30, 35 miles in, uh, in Holland, away from the German border. Now, President Franklin Roosevelt adopted the idea on January 3, 1945, and thereafter it became a part of American policy to include it in war crimes proposals. Roosevelt died on April 12, 1945, and then on the following day, Justice Robert Jackson gave a speech before the American Society of International Law in which he not only advocated a trial of the Nazi war criminals, but above all, a fair trial. At the suggestion of Samuel Rosenman, who had handled the matter of war crimes tribunals for President Franklin Roosevelt, President Harry S. Truman appointed Robert Jackson to negotiate arrangements for the trial and to represent the United States at the trial. Jackson was a strong advocate of an international tribunal. His views sometimes ran contrary to those of the other three countries participating in the war crimes project. Usually, he prevailed. He was very dynamic and extremely eloquent. And it's a fair statement that there might have never been an Nuremberg war crimes tribunals, uh, trials without Jackson. The four victorious powers met in August 1945 in London to develop a charter to govern the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg. In preparing the U.S. position, Justice Jackson included as several counts not only crimes against peace, but also conspiracy as an independent crime, which was not part of the Napoleonic Civil Code, and so that the, that the continental nations followed. Thus, the French and the USSR delegates initially opposed the inclusion of conspiracy as an independent crime. They created, this created rough going for Jackson, 
although he eventually did prevail. In approaching Nuremberg, the Soviet representatives basically wanted the crime of aggressive war limited to what the Nazis did, with no generic application. The Russians, I believe, felt that the charges could be extended to cover some of their own activities. At the same time, the French, who disliked the conspiracy charge, also wanted the charges limited to violation of treaties. Justice Jackson's definition of crimes against peace, which was included in the London Charter, read as follows, quote, planning, preparation, initiation, or waging a war of aggression, or a war in violation of international treaties, agreements, or assurances, or participation in a common plan or conspiracy for the accomplishment of any of the foregoing. At Nuremberg, I worked on the case against the German general staff. In fact, I wrote part of the final brief against the general staff and high command. I remember very clearly the evidence we had against some members of that group on the issue of aggression. The evidence was from Hitler's own files as prepared by his adjutants. The following is an example. At a meeting with his top commanders on November 7, 5, 1937, Hitler said the following, quote, the history of all times, Roman Empire, British Empire, has proved that every space advanced and expansion can only be effected by breaking resistance and taking risks, end of quote. He continued the question, the question, he continued, quote, the question for Germany is where the greatest possible consequence could be made at the lowest possible cost. The German question can only be solved by force, and this is never without risk, end of quote. Then on May 23, 1939, at a meeting with his military commanders in the Reich's Chancellery, Hitler announced his decision to attack Poland at the first suitable opportunity. He said, quote, there will be war. Our task is to isolate Poland. On August 22, 1939, he again met with his top commanders when he announced his decision to make war on Poland. He said, quote, now Poland, quote, now Poland is in the position in which I wanted her. I am only afraid that at the last moment, some Schweinhund will make a proposal for mediation. I shall give a propagandistic, propagandistic cause for war for starting the war. Never mind whether it's plausible or not. The start will probably be ordered by Saturday, August 22nd, 26th, end of quote. There followed a number of appeals by world leaders to Hitler to refrain from forcing the issue uh, with Poland to the point of war. All their appeals fell on deaf ears, and on August 31, Hitler issued his final directive for the attack on Poland which was launched in the morning of September 1, 1939, and which marked the beginning of World War II. There are a number of the defendants at Nuremberg who attended these meetings with Hitler, and they were charged with, uh, by the International Military Tribunal with aggression and conspiracy to commit aggression. At Nuremberg, the judges took a conservative view of, cons of the conspiracy charge, which was reflected in the judgment of the IMT Tribunal. 14 of 22 defendants charged with conspiracy, 14 of the 22 defendants which were charged with conspiracy were acquitted, and on the other hand, 12 of the 17 defendants uh, charged with crimes against peace were found guilty, and only five were acquitted on that count. The problem with the judgment of the IMT tribunal in its handling of the aggression charge and, its conspiracy, and, uh, and the conspiracy to commit aggression charge is that it does not contain significant generic language dealing with the concept of aggression. The IMT true tribunal came down hard against aggression, saying it is, quote, the supreme international crime, end of quote which included, in essence, all other war crimes, but it limits its coverage to the factual situation involving particular defendants, particularly individuals. There is no sweeping discussion of aggression, per se, or what other perquisites, i.e. reg, there are for, conviction, for convicting particularly individuals of aggression. 
In other words, how involved in the policy of aggression does an individual have to be to get a convicted? Specifically, does the individual have to be on the policy level where he could have influenced policy and failed to do so? In essence, the IMT tribunal held in its judgment that aggressive war was the ultimate international crime, but did not elucidate its scope or its application to lesser government officials or others, as distinct from those tried at Nuremberg. Telford Taylor, my superior at Nuremberg, said that certain questions about crimes against peace remain unanswered, <coughs> remain unanswered after Nuremberg. How to assess the accused individual's relation to the unlawful enterprise? What degree of knowledge of the plans or of the aggressive character of the war must he have possessed? What type of action must he have taken? How important a position must he have occupied? And how influential in determining national policy must he have been? And must he have been? At what stage of the criminal enterprise must he have become involved? Is it sufficient that he merely waged aggressive war after its inception if he had no share in its planning or initiation? Criticism of the decision has been based upon the lack of any authority definition of aggression, aggressive war. The question which proved most troublesome was how to assess the guilt of, the, of accused individuals. The principles laid down in the judgment of the IMT tribunal were endorsed by the General Assembly of the United Nations in late 1946. The landmark case was followed by 12 subsequent proceedings at Nuremberg. In all but one case, the aggressive war charge struck out, although it was charged in a number of cases. Control Council Law No. 10, enacted by the four powers in December 1945, governed the subsequent proceedings. The definition of crimes against peace was broadened to include not only aggressive war, but also invasions. And here they were talking about the invasion of che Austria and that of <coughs> Czechoslovakia. There are 12 trials in the Nuremberg uh, subsequent proceedings. In all the trials of, of the industrialists, crimes against peace were charged, but there are no findings of guilt. It was a different story in the ministry's case, which was the last of the Nuremberg subsequent proceedings. In the ministry's case, five of the defendants were convicted of crimes against peace, von Piesacker, Vormann, and Kepler of the Foreign Office of Germany, Lammers, chief of Hitler's Reich's chancellery, and Kerner, Paul Kerner, Goering's alter ego in the four-year plan. These were the first convictions for the, crimes, for the commission of crimes against peace that were obtained at Nuremberg since the IMT judgment. And to quote Telford, General Telford Taylor, the chief prosecutor, quote, in a vastly altered international climate, and there he referred to the Cold War. This quote is from Taylor's final report to the Secretary of War. Judgment on the uh, ministry's case was rendered on April 11, 1949, in a, in a supplementary decision upon motion on December 12, 1949, the convictions of von Wiesacker and Vorman were set aside when Judge McGuire in for inexplicably, inexplicably changed his uh, position. However, the crimes against peace convictions of Kepler, Lammers, and Kerner were reaffirmed in the December 12, 1949 decision. <clears throat> the ministry's case also broke new ground, holding that invasions of Austria in February 1938 and of post-Munich Czechoslovakia in March 1939, bloodless conquests achieved by an overwhelming display of military might without resort to a shooting war were also wholly aggressive in character and accordingly crimes against peace. In the Tokyo trials which followed Nuremberg, General MacArthur, the U.S. commander, appointed judges from a number of countries to pass judgment on the evidence against the Japanese war crimes tribunal, war criminals. A number of the defendants were found guilty of crimes against peace and punished by hanging for the commission of their crimes. At Nuremberg, after, after Nuremberg, 
and Tokyo, the Cold War ensued, and there were no pun was no punishment in the courts for aggression. In the special tribunals subsequently established after the end of the Cold War by the United Nations for war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and, uh, and uh, war crimes, uh, aggressive war was not included in the charges. When plans for the International Criminal Court were being developed by, in 1998, three former Nuremberg prosecutors, including myself and my very dear friend, Ben Ferenz, sitting here today, worked very hard toward getting aggression included as a crime in the Rome Statute, setting up the International Criminal Court. Although aggression was included, it was not defined in the statute. That was not until later that a working group of the Assembly of States, whose nation mem national members have ra ratified the Rome Statute and have oversight, oversight over the International Criminal Court, began trying to formulate a suitable definition that could be ratified by <coughs> seven-eighths of the members of the Assembly of States. The project will hopefully be completely completed by 2010. And I think the time is right for its inclusion in the Rome Statute as amended. In conclusion, aggressive war as a charge that has, has as a war, aggressive war as a charge has had an uneven early history. President Roosevelt endorsed it in early 1945 and it was an American creation largely suggested by William C. Chandler. But although it became part of the Nuremberg Tapestry, the IMT Tribunal did not specify what generic ingredients were necessary to ensure a finding of aggression. However, a considerable number of the defendants of the IM, in the IMT and Ministries case were found guilty of aggressive war, and that itself was important. But the holding in these cases would limit to the guilt or innocence of what particular defendants have done. With the exception of the ministry's case, there are no convictions in the subsequent proceedings or crimes against peace. Cases against the military people and industrialists charged with crimes against peace were dismissed in these courts and during the Cold War. We now have an opportunity to build a better world for the future by agreeing on a definition of aggression for use by the International Criminal Court. This is a golden moment in history, and I hope we'll take full advantage of it by securing a mutually acceptable definition, which can be adopted for the world of states, some 106, which have ratified the Rome Statute, establishing the International Criminal Court. We can no longer afford the existence of aggressive war. It is too costly in terms of both the loss of human life and, and its physical destru physically destructive effects on our planet. And the world waits, the time is late, and that is why this conference today is so very important. Thank you. Thank you. Henry is just... Uh, <clears throat> indicated to you that this is a golden moment in history. Let me, in the short time allowed, try to give you a bit of an overview of what our goals were, where we stand, where we hope to go, what some of the difficulties were. Uh, at the uh, risk of uh, antagonizing some of my old friends here, but on behalf of those who've never seen me before, allow me two minutes for a brief biography so that you'll understand where I'm coming from. Uh, I was a soldier in World War II, wearing the uniform of the United States. I had graduated from the Harvard Law School, and the Army immediately found my skills very useful as a private in the artillery. <laughs> I served in every major battle from the beaches of Normandy to the final Battle of the Bulge. As we were reaching Germany, I was reassigned to General Patton's headquarters. By that time, I was already a corporal. And uh, I became the first war crimes investigator in the United States Army. I'm sure of that. One of my assignments, in addition to digging up the bodies of murdered flyers who had been 
killed when they were caught by the Germans on the ground was to enter the concentration camps as they were being liberated and collect the evidence of the crimes. I have seen with my own eyes the horrors which uh, some of you have read about or seen about but cannot really understand unless you've been a witness or more important, a victim of that type of man's inhumanity to man. As a result of that, I'm sure that I have dedicated the rest of my life uh, primarily to trying to create a more peaceful world. And I have reached the personal conclusion uh, after very intimate connection with the subject that there will never be a war without atrocities because war making is the biggest atrocity of all. And the only way to stop the atrocities and to save the lives of men and women in uniform is to end war making. And that's what this conference is all about. And that's what I'm all about. Now you may say, well, is it possible? And I say, of course it's possible. This is a law school. It is the law in the United Nations Charter that we the peoples, in order to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, it's the only place the word war is used in the Charter, have Article 2.4 which says the use of armed force is prohibited except under the very limited circumstances of self-defense or Security Council approval. That is the law. And we shouldn't be surprised if we are here trying to uphold the law. Now, how do you go about doing that in the light of what you will hear from our distinguished keynote speaker, Professor Bassiuni, the historical evolution of all this. How do you go about doing that? There's the rub. Well, you have to change the way people think. I have been raised, and all of you have been raised, to glorify war making. Nothing is more glorious than to see the flags flying. Show me any political candidate who doesn't stand before the whole wall covered with flags. The flags are flying. The soldiers are honored. I don't want to dishonor the soldiers. I was a soldier. They gave me five battle stars when the war was over because I didn't get killed or wounded. That shouldn't be an obligation of joining the military. So war has been honored as a glorious thing, the way to conquest and power, and you've got to really carry on and be able to win every war. So there are people who do believe that war is better than law. I don't believe that. My website, my name, benforens.org, has a slogan, law, not war. And this is a law school, and I dare suggest to you that those who argue that power is the only thing that counts, and there are many intelligent and able and dedicated <coughs> citizens who believe that, are mistaken in their belief. Perhaps when they have experienced what I have experienced, uh, or studied it more carefully, they will reach the same conclusion, that law is always better than war. But how do you change their way of thinking? Can it be done? I've always confronted the idea that I'm an idealist, a dreamer. Nothing that I suggest is worthwhile. Professor Bassioni will know <laughs> that he and I and very few others left 50 years ago were arguing for an international criminal court to be created. They mocked us and laughed at us and said it couldn't be done. Now we're discussing a refinement of the statute of that court. Now, so it happened. We changed the way people thought about international criminal law. We changed about other things, many important things. Uh, I see so many women sitting here in the law school. I never saw a woman in the Harvard Law School, or in my college for that matter. The rights of women, which in the American Constitution, a great document in a great country, said they had no right to vote, they couldn't own property. That has disappeared. Slavery, we went to civil war for that. Our economy depended upon the black people being slaves of the white people. That has disappeared. These are very fundamental things. If I had time, I could give you dozens of examples where our most fundamental beliefs have been altered by recognition that the times change and the principles have got to change. And so it will be and must be in connection with war. How soon will it come about? I can only tell you, not soon. But you must build it slowly. The temple of law is built one stone at a time, like every great cathedral. And what we are doing here is trying to place one stone upon the other by saying, you've got to bring 
aggression within the jurisdiction of the court. We have this very strange situation. Someone picking up the statute of the court says there are four crimes, four crimes, because they're only concerned with major crimes of major concern to the international community. Genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and aggression. However, you can't try anybody for aggression until certain conditions have been met. It's like putting a sign up on the highway, 60 miles per hour speed limit, but nobody can be tried for it. What is the effect of that? Everybody steps on the gas. Instead of trying to deter aggression, it encourages aggression by telling them, don't worry, you can't be tried for that crime, and why can't they be tried for that crime? Well, there are two reasons. One is the real reason, and the other one is the one they use as an excuse. The real reason is the one I've indicated. People don't believe in it. They don't believe it can happen. They believe it's a nuisance. Before the Rome Conference, dozens of my friends, good, competent, honest lawyers, said, Benny, drop it, drop it. You're going to sink the whole ship. I said, no, we will not drop it, because it is right that the court should deal with aggression, as Henry King has pointed out. And lo and behold, what do you know? There it is, listed as a crime. Those who were at the Rome Conference will recall, Swilm Service is here, UK representative, it was a very, very close call. It was almost dropped completely. But since they didn't want it, and they couldn't say we're in favor of war, that's not nice. So they said, ha ha, it has not been defined. Aggression has to be defined. Nulla pena sine lega. Be careful when you hear Latin, they're trying to confuse you, unless you're a priest. Uh, <laughs> you have to define the crime. Was Justice Jackson trying people unfairly for a crime of aggression? Weren't they informed beforehand? You'll hear from the history. Of course they weren't formed beforehand. We were dozens of statutes, meetings, conferences, committees in the first, after the First World War. Justice Jackson was a first-class lawyer. He would certainly uphold the principle of fair trial for all of the accused. The Americans agreed, the British agreed, the Russians agreed, the Soviet Union agreed, and France had agreed. Then they referred that problem to the various committees of the UN. Referring something to a various committee of the UN is like referring them to an undertaker parlor. <laughs> Take their time. The corpse is dead anyway, just you know, play around with it. Uh, it went through committees. 20, 30 years. Depends on where you start counting the committees. And in the end, they came out with a definition of aggression by consensus. Consensus. Everybody agreed. Everybody agreed. What did it say? I was there. I sat through those meetings. They invited me to stand with all these nice lawyers on the, in the United Nations and take a nice picture of this historic event. It said aggression is whatever the Security Council says it is. That's the bottom line. They had a big list of possible crimes, but the Security Council can say it's not a crime. They had other things which they didn't list, but the Security Council can say it is a crime. So that took them 40 years. You know what you're dealing with. That's the situation we find ourselves in today. One, they say there's no definition. Nonsense. Absolute, absolutely irrefutable. I don't want to call it lies because it's not polite. But it's really a bunch of lies is what it is. <laughs> because look at the record and you'll see all over the place we've got enough information in treaties, in debates, in resolutions, the Hague Agreement, all kinds of stuff. Nobody would ever be charged by a prosecutor who would the defendant say, I didn't know it was aggression. I went into Kuwait. What did I know? You tell me it's against the law to go into Kuwait? Nobody told me. It's too absurd to make that argument. The most serious argument is that they don't want to diminish the power of the Security Council because the big powers hold the council in their hand. And unfortunately, contrary to what was the intended purpose of the United Nations Charter, they would decide issues on the basis of their political interests. Of course, they have to take political interests into account, uh, but uh, they have to take into account that we are all inhabitants of one planet, and we must share our resources in such a way and manage that planet so that everyone can live in peace and human dignity. I happen to be the prosecutor for the United States in the biggest murder trial in history. Uh, 20, 22 defendants, all convicted, 13 of them sentenced to death, including six SS generals. And their argument was, we did in self-defense. Uh, we knew that the Jews were a threat. 
And uh, therefore, we have to kill them all, including all their children, thousands of children, butchered like, like lambs to the slaughter by intelligent, educated, high-ranking German officers. Well, that mentality is what we've got to change. So how do you do it in the face of saying the Security Council has got to be protected. Security Council is already protected, not only in the definition of aggression, in the UN Charter. The Council must determine when the crime of aggression has occurred. Now it's logical that the International Law Commission, very distinguished experts from all countries, said, look, you can't accuse anybody of the crime of aggression until you know the crime has been committed, until the state has committed the crime of aggression. So the Security Council is the first barrier to be overcome, it's already there. And you have it specifically in the definition of aggression. You have it in the International Law Commission's definition, relying on the Nuremberg definition, which Henry King has read to you. It outlines all the parameters of what you need, the elements of the crime. It's all there. They don't need anything else. And as far as the Security Council of Protection is concerned, they've got the court tied up hand and foot. They have barriers. First of all, you have 18 judges elected from all corners of the world. The ladies will be happy to know that the first seven judges elected were women. I thought, boy, they're not going to let a man on the bench as <laughs> they went through. But I think somehow they decided, let's get that out of the way. And uh, so we have all of these protections. The Security Council specifically in the Rome Statute can say, stop whatever you're doing. Article 16 says, send it back to us. We'll stop the proceedings. What could be more effective than that? They have a principle of complementarity. Any nation can stop the proceedings. Say, we're going to try to defend it, and we're able to do so. Any nation can stop the proceedings by simply adopting, and this is some advice the Americans should pay attention to, adopt the Rome Statute. It becomes part of our national code. Then they try it in American courts only, and not in foreign courts. The objection that we're not going to let America be tried by a foreign court. I mean, you know, this is the point of view of very many Americans in this administration, in the past administration, and in the future administration. So we've got to deal with that some way. And the way is by pointing to the fact that it can be changed and it should be changed. Uh, the definition of aggression has been more than adequately defined. The Security Council rights have been fully protected. Those two obstacles which have to be overcome before the court can act on the jurisdiction can be overcome by simply noting the truth. It has been defined the Security Council interests are protected. The clause saying the court cannot act should be stricken from the document. It's the only crime of all the crimes listed, all the war crimes, including conduct on becoming an officer or offenses against human dignity, as though those don't need a definition. All the other crimes are accepted except the crime of aggression. Don't tell me it's not because you don't know what the crime is. Don't tell me there are all kinds of obstacles. You don't want to stop aggression. If you are in that category, you vote against me. You say, no, no, we don't need it. It's terrible. We've got to be precise. We have to protect the rights, blah, 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 sovereignty and all that stuff. If you want to stop war, that's where you come in. I've almost given up hope uh, with the diplomats. They come instructed by their delegates. We have a very excellent chairman, Ambassador Christian Wienerwesser, who will be addressing you later the day. His excellent representative, Mr. Bariga, is here uh, to represent him. There are limits to what he can do. He's an impartial chairman. He can't push them. They come with instructions from their government. The foreign ministers know very little. Sometimes they even overrule their experts while mentioning names. Uh, and so we've got to pull these strands together somehow. And we can only look to the young people for that. Uh, it's fantastic. It's beautiful. When the definition of aggression was reached in 1974, there were two people in that room who were not being paid to be there. It was me and my wife. Uh, all the rest of them were paid to take a position. And it was a position of their government. And they've been repeating it ever since. Uh, and that's about all you can expect. So you've got to ask yourselves, everybody in this audience, do you want war or you don't want war? If you don't want war, then pound the table and say it's a provision, says it's a crime. Let the court try it. Let the court decide. We have 18 qualified judges, carefully selected, well paid, waiting to make a decision. 
why can't you give them a chance to try it? So let me, let me end, uh, because uh, time is out, and I don't want to intrude on the valuable time of uh, my friend Basuni. Uh, one of these days, this torch is going to slip from my hands. It will then be up to the younger people. I'm now in my 89th year. Henry, I think, is a little bit older, but he won't admit it. Uh, and uh, somebody has got to... He gave to me a birth certificate to prove it. That's right. Otherwise, he didn't believe me. He's a very doubting fellow. Um, so let your voices be heard. If your voices will be heard, I hope they will be effective, and I wish you well. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, they say there are no more living heroes. Well, they're wrong. These are mine. Thank you, guys. <laughs>